Thanks, well, thank you. I'm okay. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry about that. I just, uh, just remembered one of the things I've forgotten. We're still missing one or two of the uh, little gadgets that uh, uh, Natasha and uh, Kevin used. So if you've still got one, could you make sure you hand them over <coughs> to either Natasha or Kevin? Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, David. <clears throat> well, good morning, afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the Rosemarkey Caves Project. I'll go straight into it. It started in 2006 after Simon Gunn, you see here, a local amateur archaeologist, discovered a number of old sea caves on the shoreline between Rismarki and Cromarty. Simon was particularly interested in the potential for the prehistoric use of the caves, uh, especially during the Mesolithic. Unfortunately, we have yet to find any of that early uh, occupation evidence. But Caird's Cave, one of the larger caves in the group, located close to Rismarki, had been extensively excavated by Dr. William McLean and Colonel William Hall between 1907 and 1912, and produced an important assemblage of boneworking debris and bone tools, which were later donated to the National Museums of Scotland. The material included an exceptionally fine amber inlaid pin dated on typological grounds to the 8th or early 9th centuries AD. The initial stages of the project included a walkover survey to identify caves between Rosmarki and Cromarty, and to carry out detailed baseline surveys recording their morphology. A total of 19 caves have been recorded, most of which are relatively difficult of access, requiring steep descents down overgrown paths and traversing the shore, some of which is dependent on the appropriate tides. In 2006, a cave named Leony 2B, and forming the main focus of this presentation, was targeted for a small-scale archaeological excavation led by Island Archaeology Services. The excavations revealed evidence for post-medieval occupation, but time constraints did not permit the evaluation of the early deposits. In 2010, larger-scale excavations led by archaeologist Hugo Anderson Weimark were carried out at Caird's Cave to establish the extent of the earlier excavations by McLean and all. These revealed the presence of in situ deposits from which a bone pin and bone working debris were recovered. The excavations also provided radiocarbon dates obtained from bone and charcoal uh, from the 4th to 3rd centuries BC and from the 2nd to 3rd centuries AD. While additional radiocarbon dates were funded by the National Museums of Scotland on work bone and antler artifacts from the original assemblage from McLean and Alls excavations. These provided evidence for activity also in the 2nd to 3rd centuries AD and the 7th to 8th centuries AD. Test pitting of eight additional caves was undertaken between 2011 and 2015 under the archaeological supervision of Mary Petrani, Lynn Fraser and myself. And we use local volunteers and especially members from the North of Scotland Archaeological Society. A number of the caves produce evidence for post-medieval occupation, including ceramics, glass, and personal objects, along with animal bone and shellfish middens. A significant number of leather shoes, leather offcuts, and potential working debris were recovered from several of the caves. <clears throat> we know from historical records and excavations elsewhere that caves were used for occupation as workshops and places of worship between the 19th and 20th centuries. Ethno-historical data from Scotland reveals that travellers lived in caves intermittently, usually through the summer months. In the Rosmarkey Caves, the discovery of the shoes and leather offcuts indicates that these traveller occupants were possibly engaged widely across the caves in shoe repair or shoe manufacture. Samples recovered during the test pitting phase of the project for radiocarbon dating produced a wide range of results and along with the post-medieval material, suggested activity in the caves spanning over 2,000 years, from the Iron Age through to the recent past. This continuity of use was particularly evident at the cluster of caves focused at Leany. The test pitting phase of the project had certainly provided a broad chronological background for the use of the caves, but the use of small trenches proved to be uh, very limited when attempting to interpret site function. It was therefore decided in 2016 to carry out a larger scale excavation at Leony 2B, which will become the smelters cave uh, of this talk. But why choose this, choose this cave for further study? The earlier excavations ad identified the remains of built walls, the earliest of these comprising a substantial lime mortared feature over one metre wide and standing to one metre high. 
The cave also contained a deep and well-stratified sequence of archaeological deposits, as with many of the other caves, with the earliest occupation horizon dating to the early medieval period. A fundamental research question relating to this important phase of activity was in regards to site function. What were people doing in caves at this time? The relatively close proximity of the site to the Pictish centre at Rosmarkey also influenced our decision to carry out further work at this cave. Finally, the discovery of a Roman coin within the excavation archive from 2006 uh, and identified as relating to the reign of Tetricus I provided additional impetus for our decisions. Unfortunately, an unstratified find. This plan shows the location of the earlier test pits at the cave. Those excavated in 2006 were limited with regards to, their in, uh, to investigating the early deposits. But the two trenches from 2014 appear to reach the natural sand horizon at the base of the archaeological sequence. In 2016, we opened up a fairly large area within the cave, which included these earlier trenches. The most recent activity in the cave produced substantial evidence for late 19th to 20th century occupation, including cobbled floors, a small hearth, and midden deposits containing a wide range of artifacts. The main occupation area was defined by a poorly constructed breached boulder wall, which sort of closed off the inner recesses of the cave, if you like. By this stage, the earlier breached wall across the entrance to the cave had been sealed off and covered by significant deposits of stone and sterile de uh, sediments. This image shows the project team excavating these extensive deposits from around this feature. The wall was constructed during the late medieval period and was designed to hold a door as revealed by the door checks. The entrance was 1.3 metres wide and the walls, now one metre high, were probably built up to higher uh, levels using wattle screens with applied clay. The archaeological deposits relating to the construction of the wall were found to be very, relatively sterile and failed to produce any evidence regarding site function. It's obviously clear that such a monumental feature was built for a specific purpose. <clears throat> Certainly, it was intended to close off the internal space of the cave from the outside world. It is possible that such a space was used for storage, for shelter, or for important gatherings such as religious worship. The wall had been built over the top of earlier midden deposits, which produced several sherds of medieval uh, redware ceramics, uh, iron fittings and concretions, and increasing amounts of butchered animal bone. Fortunately, the earliest deposits excavated within the cave relating to the early medieval horizon produced diagnostic features and materials to enable site function to be determined. Thin occupation floors, interspersed by layers of relatively sterile sand, suggest intermittent use of the cave at this time. These layers of material produce animal bone and shellfish, but to our great surprise, also produce good evidence for metalworking. The area of the metalworking activity was defined in the interior of the cave by posts and stake holes that most likely formed a wooden screen, closing off the dark back recesses of the cave. Other elements of the metalworking infrastructure included a pit that most likely housed the furnace, a circular cobbled area adjacent to this that may have produced a stance for the operation of the bellows, a small hearth curbed on two sides using small beach cobbles, and a pit containing large lumps of charcoal, possibly a charcoal store or deposits from the actual uh, metalworking activities. The sandy floor layer forming the metalworking horizon produced slag deposits, planar convex hearth base fragments, and some vitrified residues, including one large clay fragment forming a part of the toyer the hole through which the bellows injected air into the furnace. Processing of the sediment samples taken in the gridded area over the metalworking horizon produced hammer scale, and preliminary analysis of this by Gemma Cruikshanks at National Museum Scotland suggests that possible bloom refining and smithing was taking place in the cave. There are good Iron Age parallels for metalworking in caves elsewhere in Scotland, especially on the island of Skye. The evidence for small-scale metalworking prompted the extension of the main trench into the dark alcove to the north. This involved the removal of the post-medieval cobble floor and a sequence of midden deposit deposits. Remarkably, the extension produced no other uh, metalworking residues, and this probably suggested that the wooden screen represented by these posts and stake holes contained the spread of this material. An interesting point when I come to uh, the last parts of this talk. 
The amount of butchered animal bone increased dramatically in this area on reaching the sandy early medieval horizon, some of which appeared to be cattle and formed distinct groups. And cleaning back this material further revealed something completely unexpected. The outline of a large beach cobble appeared through the sand, along with two articulated upper and lower leg bones. It took a little time for us to gather our thoughts to start on this, the darkness of the alcove adding to our initial tentative interpretations. However, a few more careful scrapes of the trowel soon suggested that we had indeed uncovered human remains. <clears throat> Other stones also started to appear in the area, overlying the bones, and revealed that these, like the larger beach cobble, had probably been used to pin down the body. This plan shows the location of the beach stones. So that we call out on the left-hand side there. <clears throat> Knowing full well that the next stage in our excavation process would require informing the police and procurator fiscal, we uncovered enough of the remains so that informed recommendations could be made on their interpretation and inspection. This image shows the partially uncovered human remains after removal of the beach cobbles. The cranium is still covered by a cache of butchered animal bone, again probably cattle, with a second larger cache to the right. And also individual butchered bones located from around the body. These indicated in red, the red arrows. Dingwall and Inverness police arrived the next morning and their investigation of the exposed remains, along with my detailed description of the burial environment, suggested that we had indeed uncovered ancient human remains. After phone calls to the Procurator Fiscal, providing additional details of our discovery, we were allowed to proceed with our excavations and recovery uh, of the individual. It was at this stage that Professor Dame Sue Black, the Centre of Anatomy and Human Identification at the University of Dundee, contacted me regarding our discovery. The Procurator Fiscal had already submitted our digital images to Sue, who was their first point of contact, if you like, with regard to the discovery of human bones. Sue and her department kindly offered a full forensic analysis of the remains, along with a digital reconstruction of the individual's face. Facial reconstruction, however, uh, would depend on the ability to piece together the skull of the individual, which displayed evidence of severe trauma and fragmentation. It was clear from the stratigraphic relationships that the indiv individual dated at least to the early medieval period. But there was no diagnostic evidence, such as grave goods, to provide any further clues. However, evidence relating to the individual's demise soon presented itself after revealing the skull. The roughly circular exit wound of the right temple area suggested that this was probably no accident. With the human remains successfully removed from the cave and excavations completed for the 2016 fieldwork season, we arranged for the delivery uh, to Sue at Dundee. I would now like to run through the forensic evidence and biological profile of the individual, whom we had already named her as Marky Mann, much to Sue's surprise, I think, based on the shape of the skull and robust nature of the bones. His remains were well, well preserved, as you can see from the photographs, and recovery of the skeleton almost 100%. There was some breakage to ribs and a few other bone elements, most likely a result of the excavation process. And due to the severe trauma identified on the man's skull, X-ray analysis was first conducted on the cranial elements to look for metal splinters and possible fragments, which might be suggestive of a weapon uh, used to inflict such trauma. Unfortunately, none were found. Or fortunately, whichever way you want to look at it. <clears throat> the individual was male, between 25 and 35 years of age, with Caucasian, and stood between 5 foot 6 and 5 foot 9 inches high. Although some slight pathology was identified on his vertebrae to suggest possible mild osteoarthritis and some back pain, this was a robust and healthy individual in the prime of his life. It had been well nourished and his teeth were in excellent condition with no caries, although there was a buildup of tartar on the gum line. He had very strong muscle attachments to his lower arms, capable of producing a very strong grasp, which may be indic indicative of his work. There was no sign of systemic pathology previous ill trauma or disease. The only trauma that he had sustained was to his head. And I'll just work through these one by one. The first blow was to the right side of the mouth and it fractured two of his teeth in the mandible and displaced one back into the bone due to the sheer force. You can see where the individual teeth have split due to the force of the blow. 
And the tooth germ at the bottom there, I found uh, below the, the sternum in the thorax area, and it's a clear indication that he was still alive as he lightly inhaled or swallowed the tooth after the impact. The second blow came to the left side of the jaw with some force. It severely fractured the left side of his chin and caused fractures on both sides of the jaw focused on the condylar processes, pointed out by the arrows there. The force of the blow was also set off a radial fracture internally along the base of the skull. The next injury was a contact injury, probably caused by the man falling, uh, hitting his head against something hard, perhaps the rock wall or something like this, and probably came as a result of the impact uh, of number two. Then it gets more grisly. While he's on the ground, a rounded implement is then pole-driven through the side of his head from left to right, just in front of the temple region. This set off fracturing around the, the skull and was most likely the cause of death. He would, have, would not have recovered this, according to Sue. This was the same implement used in Trauma 1 and most likely uh, had a rounded cross-section about one centimetre in diameter. You can see the exit point here where the bone fractured outwards from within the skull. Uh, Rosemarky Mann was definitely dead by now. However, the trauma already delivered to our unfortunate victim was obviously not deemed to have been sufficient. Trauma 5. The final coup de grace was a blow to the top of his head of tremendous force, creating a large penetrative wound which set up massive fracturing of the skull. This was performed by a different implement, plus a used in a swinging motion. This final blow would have been carried out while the man was prone and suggests significant overkill. The man was killed and he was killed again. Today, this sort of forensic evidence, Sue told me, would be categorized as a frenzied attack. We know that he was killed with at least two implements, uh, this blow from an implant that was wider at the back and narrower at the front. <clears throat> we have secured a total of six radiocarbon dates from the excavations at Smelter's Cave, and the date on the human rib overlaps with the dates from the main occupation metalworking horizon, although it sits slightly earlier, or may sit slightly earlier. Therefore, it appears that the body was placed in the cave immediately prior to or contemporary with the occupation and metalworking horizon. The stratigraphic levels within the burial environment within the main metalworking area would also suggest that the raised knees of the individual and the large beach cobble lying over his lower limbs would have been visible above ground level for some time, although the two areas were separated by the wooden screen. If so, and it appears that the people working within the metalworking area knew the human remains were there in the cave and that they respected this burial. Preliminary isotope results obtained from teeth and bone samples from Rosmarky Man to investigate mobility and diet and interpreted by Dr. Kate Britton from the University of Aberdeen suggest it was most likely local to the area. With regards to diet, however, we have some more interesting results. Rosmarky Man had similar carbon-13 ratios to the herbivores sampled from the cave and surrounding caves, suggesting that marine input into his diet was minimal. However, elevated levels of nitrogen relative to these herbivores indicates regular consumption of iotrophic level foods. When Kate compared these results with previously published human and faunal data from other contemporary British sites, including Anglo-Saxon and Pictish, the elevated nitrogen value of Rosmarky Man was further accentuated. This highlights that the source of protein in the diet of the individual is different than contemporary Pictish populations elsewhere in Scotland, including the Pictish phase at Port Mahomac, and likely included a considerable proportion of iotrophic level terrestrial protein. This may have included freshwater fish, waterfowl, or terrestrial fauna such as suckling pigs. A similar elevated nitrogen value was determined in a male individual from a high status burial at the Pictish Cemetery site of London Lynx in Fife. This may indicate a correlation between status and diet in the Pictish period. We've also submitted samples for DNA analysis, but unfortunately I think we'll be another six months or so before we get the re results of those. So what did Rosemarkin Man look like? Well, Unfortunately, I think somebody's beat me to that because it's on the front of your pamphlets, but uh, we may as well go through it anyway. But I must thank uh, Dr. Chris Ryan uh, at CAHID for this uh, fascinating reconstruction. I'm not going to do the movie thing. It would have taken so long. But first of all, we can look at him uh, with no air. 
quite a robust. Sue thought he was a man to die for. <laughs> and if we put some fuzzy stuff on, then he takes on a slightly different appearance, but he's quite a good looking guy. Concluding this presentation, I would like to put forward a few remarks regarding his marking man, which will hopefully stimulate discussion. One of the major questions emerging from the discovery is whether this was a brutal murder from the early medieval period, or was this some form of ritual or sacrificial killing? First of all, the position of the burial was unusual. Laid out in a supine posture, the arms by the side, low limbs had been drawn up into this butterfly shape with the knees splayed and raised upwards. Heavy beach cobble, about 0.45 meters long and 27 kilos in weight, had been placed over the feet and lower limbs, as shown in the photograph, and smaller cobbles placed over the right hand and forearm and upper left femur. This was a deliberate burial procedure, which is often classified as a deviant. Perhaps the body was weighted down as an attempt to render a corpse safe, to prevent the spirit from returning to seek vengeance against the living. This is the treatment of a body that was different from the norm, whether for good or bad. If this was simply a brutal murder and the cave a convenient place to dispose of the body, would the assailants have gone to the trouble of laying the body out in this particular manner? There were no grave goods, nor any evidence for fastenings from clothing. Did he meet his death naked, for example? There is also the potential offering of butchered animal bone placed over the cranium and around his body. It is clear that this individual has suffered a terrible death, and may have suggest, uh, many have suggested sorry, that he must have been taken by surprise and attack, and probably by more than one assailant. There is no evidence for self-defence. It is possible, however, that the man had been bound, or he could even have been drugged, although we have no evidence to substantiate this. Much of the ev evidence I've shown you there, including the extreme overkill, is very reminiscent to what that's seen in bog bodies, including multiple traumas and the pinning down of individuals using stakes and withies in these boggy pools. Many of the bog bodies also display evidence for good nutrition and were generally well-groomed individuals. This even prompted Dr. Ned Kelly from National Museums of Ireland to suggest that these individuals derive from the upper classes of society in prehistory. Whatever the case may be here, we know from other excavations uh, in Scotland and elsewhere in the UK and Europe that caves have been used in prehistory for the preparation and display of human remains. One only has to look across uh, the water from uh, Rosmarkin to Cowsey, uh, the working arm it's doing there recently as well, uh, in Murray. We've also recorded unusual burial practices uh, from the Iron Age at the Eye Pasture Cave complex on the island of Skye. Caves are liminal and dark places. However, we also know that these special natural locations in the landscape were selected for a whole range of activities in the past, including craftworking and metalworking. Metalworking in particular was viewed as a powerful and magical process, one befitting an unusual venue that served to highlight specialised and elite skills. We hope to investigate this avenue of research further at the Leany Caves with regard to the early medieval activities. We now we have the metalworking, but at Cairds we have this overwhelming evidence for working in antler and bone from the same period. Did these caves function as craft workshops with connections to the emerging power centre at Rosmarkey? An important ecclesiastical site was eventually established in Rosmarkey and could have provided a central authority to control and direct elite skills and in industries such as metalworking. Martin Carver's excavations at Port Mahomet, of course, have also provided substantial evidence to suggest that these power centres were also the venues for major industrial and craft activities. The link between Rosmarkey Man and the metalworking taking place in the cave is tangible. Is it even possible to have been a metalworker himself? It was a fit man with particularly strong forearms that would have developed through such repetitive activities. Connections between metalworking and burial practices have been identified at other late prehistoric sites in Scotland, such as the burial of a woman placed below the slab floor of a metal and craftworking structure at Minehow in Orkney. Many of the earliest burials recorded on monastic sites, such as Whitorn, the Isle of May, Port Mahomet, Govan, and St Andrew's Kirkhill, have also been linked with craftworking and industrial activity, especially metalworking. Some of their burials are even inserted into these craft and craftworking areas in the, in the centres. The discovery of such a complete skeleton from the early med medieval period is rare, especially beyond burial complexes such as those recorded at nearby Port Mahomet and Balentor. This man's death whether brutal murder or a selfless act of sacrifice for the good of the local community, provides the potential to investigate a narrative associated with the late Iron Age and Pictish cultural traditions and the arrival of Christianity. 
Finally, I would like to say a big thank you to our funders, Sue Black and her team, especially from Cahir, the other specialists and uh, individuals, and of course, of course the, the, the volunteers who help us to excavate these wonderful sites. Thank you very much.